Chris Sale can't catch a break because in just his second MLB start off the IL from his rib injury, the sack starter suffered yet another season-altering blow against the Yankees. Now, in the bottom of the first, Sale took a comebacker from Aaron Hicks that hit off his left pinky. Now the ball bounced into right field for an RBI single after hitting Sale, scoring Labor Torres. Now Sale was in obvious pain and frankly knew the finger was broken the moment it happened as he promptly walked off the mound into the Red Sox dugout before his manager, Alex Cora, and the Red Sox trainers could get to him to evaluate the injury. Now, this is obviously a tremendous blow for the Red Sox ball club and an even bigger blow to Chris Sale himself because Chris Sale has been working extremely hard to get back on a big league mound ever since the end of 2019. Of course, 2020 and basically all of 2021 was a wash for Sale as he underwent Tommy John surgery. And here in 2022, Sale started a new campaign on the IL after suffering a fracture of his rib cage during spring training. So if you're a Red Sox fan, this just sucks. I mean, Chris Sale's the guy you expected to come back help your team with this playoff push and be that number one in a wild card series because they're not catching the Yankees. The Yankees are winning the division. Their eyes are set on the wild card. And right now, they would make the wild card if the season ended the day. However, if Chris Sale is not available for the playoffs, I really do believe it's going to be tough for the Sox to lead in the wild card series and frankly win a game against any one of these other junior circuit squads. The Mariners are red hot, obviously. Again, their playoff history is limited, so maybe your best chance is against the Mariners. But even at that, I think the Mariners will be a tough uh, opponent to face in the wild card. The Blue Jays are going to be really tough if they get their stuff together. The Orioles will be a pesky team as well, and the Rays are always there. So, in my opinion, the Red Sox need Sale to gain a leg up in the wild card series, whoever they face. Now, next, Juan Soto turned down a 15-year, $440 million uh, contract offer made by the Washington Nationals on Saturday. Now, you might be wondering why would Soto ever, for a moment, ponder the thought of turning down this deal. Well, according to John Amon, there were multiple reasons as to why Soto turned down the offer, such as the fact the deal itself was backloaded, it was a relatively low AAV, and the fact there is uncertainty surrounding the ownership uh, of the Washington Nationals. Now, when it comes to what type of contract Soto is looking for, well, Soto is reportedly looking for a deal that is at least a decade long, gives him the most guaranteed money in baseball history, and gives him an AAV at least close to one of the highest ever given to a baseball player in baseball history. Now, I also personally think that Soto's agent, Scott Boris, knows that a long-term contract like this pretty much guarantees that at some point in the future, the club will have to defer the contract and extend the length of the deal for another 10 to 12 years after Soto is done playing. So basically, it's going to be a Bobby Bonilla contract 2.0 or a Max Serger contract 2.0 because remember, Max Serger's contract is now being deferred by the Washington. Washington Nationals. And who helped Max Scherzer get that deal? Scott Boris. And I'm sure Scott Boris doesn't like those deferred deals. Players want the money now. Soto wants the money up front. That's the point. And I think Scott Boris knows these 15-year deals, at the tail end of them, the club can't afford it at that moment in time. And they're going to have to defer it because ownership changes. You never know. Maybe the new ownership the next three, four years can't afford that contract that they agreed to, and they're stuck with it, and that's what happens and turns into a uh, Bobby Bonilla situation. So, again, that's why I think and is the main reason why he turned down this deal, because Scott Boris was in his ear telling him, hey, they're basically giving you a deferred contract and going to play it out for the next 25 years after you're done playing. So, Soto does not want that, obviously. Now, for topic number three, the Tigers sent down the former number one prospect in all of baseball, Spencer Torkelson, to Triple A Toledo. Now, when asked uh, how long Torkelson will remain in Toledo, Tigers manager AJ Hinch said, quote, It could be 10 days, it could be two weeks, it could be a month. It doesn't matter how long it takes to get him back feeling good. And let me tell you, Torkelson was not feeling good. <laughs> 
because Torque ended at the first half batting 197. He was 52 for 264. Oh my god. 52 for 264. Wow. He had 11 doubles, 5 home runs, 21 RBIs, and a 68 OPS plus. Now his 577 OPS ranked 154th out of 158th qualified major league hitters. And now, although his plate discipline was above the league average, his hard hit rate sat in the 39th percentile, and his barrel percentage sat at the 37th percentile. Not to mention, in my opinion, his swing sucks. It really does. His swing sucks. Now, although his stance is fine, in my opinion, you know, when you look at him, he looks like a hitter at the plate. He really does. The way he stands is fine. I'm cool with it. But the minute he swings the bat, he is swinging and reaching for the sky. It is the most extreme and unnecessary uppercut I've ever seen from a major league player. Now, I know people compare him in a swing to Mike Trout's. However, the problem is, he's not Mike Trout. Why do I know this? Because he doesn't produce like Mike Trout. He's not even close. So don't tell me that, oh, he swings like Mike Trout, so it should be good. No. It's not good. Why? Because look at what he's producing. A buck 97. He's 52 for 264. That is... That, why, why are you even here? You should be in double A with those numbers. Now, in my opinion, he needs to be a gap-to-gap -gap hitter. I mean, cut the crap when it comes to swinging for the fences. I mean, you play at Yellowstone National Park practically, so you're not going to hit it out. Sorry, Comerica Park is gigantic. 420 in center field. 420. I mean, he just has to stop with the whole uppercut. Stop wasting your energy, stop disappointing fans, and stop disappointing yourself. Come back to the major leagues. Hit line drives, hit doubles, hit triples, and then people will love you again. But until then, you're just another flop of a prospect. You suck, Torkelson. You suck. And now, finally, it looks like the Mariners ended their first half on a high note as Seattle rattled off 14 wins in a row. Now, they will be just one win shy of capturing MLB's longest winning streak this season if they can win their first game after the All-Star break uh, on Friday, July the 22nd against the Astros at home in Seattle. Now, just for reference, there have only been three other teams in history of MLB who have gone into the All-Star break riding a double-digit winning streak. Those teams being the 1935 Detroit Tigers, that was a 10-game winning streak before the break. The 1945 Chicago Cubs, that was another 10-game winning streak before the break. And finally, the 1975 Cincinnati Reds, that was also a 10-game winning streak before the break. Now, each of those teams went on to win the pennant during those seasons, with the Tigers and the Reds winning it all in 1935 and 1975, respectively. So, that basically means, if you believe history repeats itself, the Mariners will at least, at minimum, be in the World Series this year, and hey, they may even win the whole thing. And with that, that's all I got. Hope you guys enjoyed. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. As always, I'm going to catch you guys later.